Welcome everyone to Dissertation 101, Organizing the Literature Review Chapter. I'm Dr. Basil Considine. I'm here from the ACU Online Writing Center, and we're going to be diving into the chapter that probably gives students the single most trouble and takes the longest time to write. This is a webinar that is designed to help students such as yourself, so please feel free to ask questions along the way. If you're not comfortable asking your question in the open chat, just send me a private message and I'm happy to answer it. So we're going to be talking about the literature review chapter. Now the literature review chapter, whether you're in a doctor of nursing practice project, whether you're writing a EDD dissertation or a different type of document, literature review is designed to ground what you are doing so that it is clear to your reader and to your faculty committee that your research is informed by what has come before, that is building on it and drawing on it, and that you are not uh, repeating things that have already been done with no purpose. And so the, the findings or conclusions that you derive later on will be clearly conceptualized and contextualized, meaning we know what the significance of your findings will be and then people will be better suited to apply them. Now, a little word on that. There is something in research called replication studies, where you are repeating something that someone has already researched with the goal of confirming that something is going on or confirming that this phenomenon is found in a particular situation that might not be the same as a previous study or finding if something can be applied in another area. That's all fine. And in your literature review chapter and in your research methods chapter, you will be telling your reader how exactly your work relates to that previous stuff. And so it's clear it, what the implications are of the findings. If you're doing original novel research in an area, you may be pointing out, oh, this hasn't been done here. And so consider that but if it's something where you're following up on research, there's actually a lot of research that is not so much disproven as it's found to not be as generalizable as people first thought. Let me explain. There is a lot of research that turns out to be more specific or more accurate to a certain population. And if we look at things such as population studies, a lot of the initial research on say BMI, body mass index, and what is quote unquote normal was actually done on very homogeneous samples. And that over time, as the country has diversified and people have acknowledged the diversity that was already there, it's been more clear that a lot of the research that was based on this, it's not so much that it's inaccurate, but that it's only accurate for a very specific group. So, for example, there was a lot of medical research that was done in World War II on military draftees who had just gone through boot camp. And I don't know about you, but uh, I think the average person who goes through boot camp will be in much better physical condition than uh, I am right now. And I, I say that as someone who enjoys running marathons, but, you know, I don't tend to go on 15 mile runs with 40 pound packs of gear. So a lot of things knowing how it's been done gives you an idea about is it applicable to the situation that you're talking about and that's a major feature of the literature review chapter so today we're going to be talking about four major objectives first to understand the five most common the five main or core literature review chapter sections to talk about how to conduct and document the literature search process understand the basic principles for a theoretical or conceptual framework, and to understand some core principles for writing and organizing the literature review. And again, I encourage questions along the way. So first off, what sections should you have in the literature review chapter? Now, if you look at the dissertation guidebook, you'll see some sections prescribed, but let's talk about the whys, because there is a method to that madness, as it were. So the first section that you'll have will be an introduction. And it's important to realize that most people 
have not and do not read dissertations cover to cover. People are busy. They usually are looking for that specific thing that is relevant to the task that they're doing. So if they want to know what your research design was, they'll turn to chapter three. They just want to review your findings because they're interested in something similar. They'll go to your literature review chapter. They just want to know the basic outline of your study. They'll go to chapter one. They're just interested in the results. They'll look at chapter four or chapter five, depending on whether they want to see the raw data or how you've interpreted that and what conclusions you've drawn from it. So the introduction for the literature review chapter is for those people who are just interested in seeing what you found in your literature search. And so they flip right to chapter two. And that's why you have a one to three paragraph introduction. Now, a section that we strongly recommend that you include, in part because it anticipates questions that your committee will have, is to have a literature search methods section that would be one to three paragraphs that documents where you went looking, like what search engines or what libraries, when you went looking, like what publication years, and how you went looking, like things like keyword searches or filters that you used, because those will have a profound effect on the results that you get. And, you know, if you're at a R1, a research intensive institution, it's likely you'll have access to many things electronically, but that doesn't mean that you'll have access to all of them. Some of these very specialized journals are really expensive. You know, when a single journal costs $50,000 a year for an institution to subscribe, they usually don't subscribe to many of those. So you might have access to something that someone else doesn't and vice versa. And if they look at your literature search methods thing and you say, oh, oh hold on, they use this ProQuest subscription, I have this different one that that has something else. I see something that I need to check now. That's very helpful to have. The third section is going to be your theoretical framework or your conceptual framework. And it should be one of the two, not both. I've seen some people write separate theoretical conceptual framework sections. It's usually because they're confused about the distinction and it's a lot of unnecessary work. We'll talk more about the distinction between those two, but you should have one section and it should either be called theoretical framework or called conceptual framework. It That can be more open-ended in length because sometimes the framework that someone picks is deeply related to the research design. And so there's a lot that's been written about it. And other times they're applying something from another field. And so they might have a page or two about it. So it's more open-ended in length, but it should definitely be smaller than the body of the literature review, the main section of the literature review, which is when you're discussing most of the specific studies. And that will be by far the largest. It should be larger than all the other sections combined several times over, usually. And then a brief conclusion. Uh, the conclusion is mostly about just summarizing the key themes of your literature review findings and then describing the next chapter. Now, you might ask the question, well, wait, why should the conclusion describe the next chapter? I know it's going to be the research methods chapter. Well, uh, actually not always. So the most common social sciences dissertation structure is the five chapter structure that we use at ACU. But not every university does that. Some will have a six chapter or, uh, breakdown. Some will have as many as 10 chapters. Now, I. I personally think that 10 chapters ends up being more writing than you need to do because you end up introducing every chapter. But the because of this variability, if you are requesting a dissertation chapter, especially back in the old days where you weren't able to just download it. And so, if, for example, if you're ordering, there's a dissertation you want and it's only available through a service that charges you, you'll probably try and order just the pages you think you need and if it turns out the information you want is in another chapter, having that conclusion say, all right, in the next chapter, here I discuss this, helps you decide what to order next. So let's talk more about those things. In the introduction to your lit review chapter, you want to briefly introduce your study, your project, whatever it is you're working on, for the benefit of readers who are turning specifically to that chapter. You want to state the research design, like, you know, this is a phenomenological study of blah. 
conducted at this type of institution or with this population, you know, just very briefly. So the reader has an idea of why you're discussing the things that you're, you are. And you want to outline the broader structure of the chapter. So somewhere in there, there should be an outline where you describe in order the major sections of the dissertation, the subsections of the literature review chapter. That's usually very easy to write, but when you leave it out, committees tend to say, well, your introduction seems rather slow, and uh, I'm not sure what you're actually going to be discussing because there just isn't enough detail for them to feel that they've been oriented. All right, the literature search methods. Again, this is one to three paragraphs. It depends on how complex your search was. If it was just electronic, often it can be covered in a paragraph or two. If you had something where you were working with more exotic sources, say archival documents, you might have some discussion of that as well and how that those documents or that type of document have and have not been used previously. But for describing literature search methods, the primary pieces of information when you search, like, oh, I was looking at studies published between 2011 and 2021. Where you search, like what databases or libraries or library catalogs, and how you search, which is mostly going to be keywords and any filters that you used to screen the results. So often people will do an initial search and they report, oh, I got you know, 10,000 results. To narrow this down, I did these things. And then the list like, oh, I filtered it to only look at peer reviewed journals in English, for example. And that helps us trace your steps. It's also something that helps you justify to your committee that you have done adequate research by showing, oh yes, I did look for these things. If they look look at your literature reviews length and it's you know, only six pages and they look at your references and it's one page, they will probably have some questions. So this literature search methods section is in part you were showing that you did do your due diligence and maybe that'll be your initial search and they give you suggestions for how to expand it. And then you'd expand that and expand your lit review. That happens a lot. But by being very clear, it helps you know, help you explain and help you see where you can look if you end up needing to look more places. All right, so the body of the literature review chapter, this is going to be the largest section. And this is where you give an organized description and discussion of the major and keyword relevant findings that inform the work that you are doing and why you've made the choices that you have for this. And there are many different ways to organize that within it. Some people will go thematically, some people will go more chronologically, some people will look at it and say, well, let's start with discussing the seminal research on that, and then we'll go into a more thematic organization. But throughout this section, the things that people get comments on the most are first, not having clear topic sentences, not having analysis. That's when you're discussing the different studies or findings and how they relate to each other or the significance of things like, oh, they found this conclusion, but they only interviewed six people. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt. Or they interviewed 100 people, but they were all from this little town in Wisconsin. And so it might not be representative of the rest of the area that they're describing. And synthesis is when you find and make new meaning out of the research. And we've got webinars and all of those if you're thinking, oh, uh, I need to brush up on that. In general, you do not want to have paragraphs that are all or mostly summary. There should be that clear topic sentence stating why you are discussing this or how it relates to previous things. The analysis where you discuss what the findings or the actions mean. And the synthesis, we talked about that earlier. And the conclusion is fairly brief. This is not something that people usually have trouble writing. You summarize the key findings and you preview the, new, the next chapter. And it can often be done in just one or two paragraphs. So let's talk a little bit about that conducting and documenting the literature search process. Now, you can go here 
several different ways. You can go in through the main library website. You can go in through the distance education portal, but you do want to be searching and you want the majority of your research. Uh, many committees will say around 80% or more of your sources to be recent literature. And people generally agree that literature that is recent, you want it to be roughly in the last five years since your dissertation, as I, in the last five years before your dissertation defense or your project defense or concept proposal defense. And so often people will start their search and they'll set a parameter that's less than five years to ensure that it will still be recent when they finally do complete their manuscript and defend. So for example, if you're starting now, I would recommend, oh, start your search with just looking at the last three years, because it's going to take you at least a year to get through the coursework for the degree. And then when you get there, it'll take some time to write the dissertation. But if you've been looking at the most recent stuff, that will help you have things that you can still use or reuse. Uh, geography. Uh, a lot of people will go off on tangents. And so I remember someone writing about the public education system in the United States, and they had a whole paragraph uh, on Kazakhstan that actually turned out to be three pages long. And that, that was should have been subdivided for clarity, but even better was to not include it at all because while it was about the topic, there's so many differences between the public school system in Kazakhstan versus the state of California that it just wasn't a helpful or meaningful uh, inclusion. And so they did all that reading and all that writing and ultimately it got cut. So you want to make sure that you're exploring stuff that is reasonably relevant and applicable to the geographic region that you're describing. And that'll vary depending on the exact project. Now, here's some of the things that you want to describe in the literature search methods section, like the databases and library systems you searched, what kinds of literature you're looking at, like peer-reviewed journal articles, government reports, the dates that you were using for your search and any date or year cutoffs. Uh, I often get asked, well, what's the difference? Why does that matter when I conducted it if I'm using these date cutoffs? Well, if we're searching now in 2023, there are six more months of 2023. So if there's something published afterwards and we finished our search, say, on Friday, that's a whole bunch of stuff from 2023 that wouldn't be included. And so someone looking to retrace the steps and say, well, wait, hold on, why didn't they include this? Uh, we'll be able to see that. And also your committee um, is less likely to push back and say, okay, we well, need to include the rest of the year when you have it clearly lined up for that in your document. Oh, yes, the terminus of the search was is on this date. And so there's a cutoff articles published after, let's say, June 30th, 2023, were not included. All right. Let's talk about frameworks. So what are theoretical and conceptual frameworks? Well, first of all, they're ways of using previous scholarship, previous ideas to structure and guide your work. Now, a quick audience poll here. How many of you have seen the movie Jurassic Park or read the book? There's that famous line when Dr. Ian Malcolm is critiquing the scientists and Hammond and saying, you know, you stood on the shoulder of giants. Well, that is how most research and most scholarship is done, where you are able to build on the work of other people and not spend all this time creating the basics. Much like, theoretically speaking, I could make a wheel for my car. However, I don't know how to work rubber. So if I was making a wheel, I'd probably start with a big tree. I'd have to chop it down. Then I'd have to make a wheel uh, by hollowing it out and rounding it. And it wouldn't be a great wheel. And so I could take it on a road trip, but it would probably break and even damage my car in the process. So if I'm able to leverage others' work 
it's analogous to my going to Costco and getting new tires and driving off an hour later. Uh, so we don't want to recreate the wheel unnecessarily. And the theoretical and conceptual frameworks is taking some piece of prior literature, some sort of idea, concept, model, theory, or several, and saying, all right, so according to this thing we're using for the framework, these types of things are important. And that forms a kind of lens, a way of looking at things and making sense of what is important that helps you narrow down the literature review and focus on specific details rather than trying to summarize everything from thousands and thousands of pages of literature that you read. And I'm not exaggerating about that thousands and thousands. By the time you finish your literature review search, the average student has read several thousand pages. All right, now, don't worry too much about the philosophical part. Again, that's coming down to different ways of determining why or how certain types of details are important. So what about those differences between theoretical and conceptual frameworks? Well, you could read a whole journal article on it. And this example here is a 11 page document on just that thing. But here's my basic summary of that. A theoretical framework is something that is based on one or more theories whose ideas, whose precepts, whose assumptions about how and explanations about how the world or some phenomenon works. You're using that as a primary basis for understanding your research. Now, a conceptual framework is basically everything other than that. It could even be a combination of a theory with something that hasn't been quite evaluated or tested to the point where we want to call it a theory. It's like a model of leadership, a philosophical idea, combining a theory and a model, all those we would call a conceptual framework. So here's your quick litmus test. If there's one or two theories, it's going to be a theoretical framework. If it's three or more, still it's, well, you're probably starting to combine things in ways that it doesn't really fit. So it might be a theoretical framework, but it might be a conceptual framework. And you can always ask your faculty to weigh in or ask the writing center to give some suggestions in that. But if it's based on models, concepts, or principles, it's a conceptual framework. And some combination of the first three, it's probably going to be conceptual framework. And if you're wondering how you can have a theoretical framework that ha has only theories based on it, uh, I've actually seen published theoretical frameworks that were based on six theories, which is a lot. And usually they're coming up with a new concept, tying all these things together. So it doesn't really fit into what any one of those theories do. Uh, usually when you have a three or more theories where it's still a theoretical framework, one of those is the principal guiding theory, and the other two are just for explaining some smaller aspects of it. Let's talk about the literature review chapter itself. And let's talk about it specifically in terms of function or purpose. What is this supposed to do? Well, you want your literature review body to demonstrate first that you understand the key literature related to whatever it is you're trying to address, the problem or issue. You want to also to demonstrate your critical evaluation because there will most certainly be findings that disagree with each other, findings that uh, conflict, that confuse, that don't agree, and that may be potentially relevant, but it's not clear that they would because there's so many, many differences with another context that you might want to apply it to. So that's why the critical evaluation is key. Now, this is creating a foundation for explaining why you're doing your research the way that you are, to interpret the findings and show that you understand the potential implications of whatever findings you'll generate with your research. 
You also want to credit other researchers for their contributions and not take credit for theirs. Taking credit for other people's research is plagiarism, and we don't want to be doing that. And to also identify gaps in the literature and how your research fits into that. Uh, a great justification for why doing this is, oh, hold on, other people have said that this is an area that needs study. And so if you are pointing that out in your lit review chapter, that helps justify your study and the research that you're doing. It also makes it clear that you're not simply duplicating something unnecessarily. So this usually starts with narrowing down your topic or issue. And some of this happens concurrently as you go from your general problem statement to finding the specific problem statement that you're specifically addressing in your research and then finding the literature that's most pertinent to that. So for example, if you were saying, oh, I want to work on teacher attrition. All right, that's a good general topic, a good general problem. But if we say, oh, the problem is high teacher attrition at US public schools, that's much more specific and helps differentiate it from say, problems of too low teacher attrition which is actually a thing. There are places where people who perhaps um, are no longer the most qualified teachers are continuing to teach and a district because of changing demographics or something else needs to have some turnover or to do something else to address the fact that the teacher's original training is no longer as good as relevant preparation for what they're doing now. And there are many ways to it do that. But the key point here is that when we go from saying teacher attrition to high teacher attrition at U.S. public schools, it's much more specific and lets you leave out a lot of stuff that is just not directly relevant. And as you narrow that down, this is one of the reasons why you'd specify the context for your study in the introduction. If we have a particular region, uh, the state of Texas, for example, oh, well, we're not going to spend too much time talking about, say, teachers in rural Maine, because that is so different culturally and population wise from a particular part of Texas and climate wise, for that matter. Uh, not too, too many snow days in Texas compared to in Maine. You also want to have clear boundaries for your literature search. It could be things like time, location, the language of publication, the population you're working with. Um, what are these delimitations that you have chosen? And what's outside the scope? And people often forget to specify this other one. And it's really helpful. Uh, you know, I happen to be multilingual. I can read literature in many languages. In general, if you're trying to finish your dissertation in a reasonable time, you want to stick to the main language where people are writing about your particular context. And that's not at all to say that, say, the Turkish Journal of Education isn't doing good research, but it's more likely to be featuring research in Turkish on Turkish schools and problems related to that, rather than things that are clearly and directly relevant to the United States. You also want to align your literature review with your draft research question or research questions. And in fact, many people will organize their literature review body to have sections that are specifically aligned with each research question. So, oh, here are the things that I need to know. Here's the relevant research related to this thing that the research question is trying to address or improve. And that a lot of that involves connecting it to the underlying problem or lack of knowledge that you're trying to address. And you also want to make it clear that the research question hasn't been answered or fully answered yet. Well, it could be studies haven't been replicated sufficiently to make it clear that this is applicable to your context, something like that. Uh, and make sure that it's not uh, actually providing an answer to the research question. Uh, because if you could answer it with the lit review, well, that's a different type of dissertation than what we do at ACU. You do want to show your search process. We talked about that. And again, make sure that 
that you are keeping notes on this. Uh, there is a way where you at the library catalog, you can actually sign in to have it save your searches. That's a great thing to do. And you can make an appointment for the librarians who will talk you through that process. But it means it's very easy to go back and see, oh, boy, here are the things that I searched for. And also, if you have multiple searches for the different questions to see, oh, yes, I can use this to go look back at those as I'm trying to organize these into the lit review chapter. And I do sometimes see that theoretical or conceptual framework at the very end of the chapter. That's actually the worst place to put it because putting the framework before the body of your lit review or at the start of the body of your lit review tells your reader how you're looking and how you're interpreting the information and justifies why you don't look at some other things or why you don't emphasize or weight highly certain types of details. And again, that's a very helpful thing to do because if you have at the beginning, then your reader reads the rest of the chapter with that in mind. And if you don't have it, you have no framework section or no framework section until the end, they're reading thinking, well, hold on, why aren't they talking about this? And then they get to the end of like, well, that would have been helpful to know earlier. So this section should go sooner rather than later in the chapter. Do make sure you state why you are discussing specific studies and how or why those findings are important. Don't just start talking about it, connect it like, oh, uh, one of the seminal studies on blah, blah, blah research is this one, author date. And now we say, oh, this is why we're doing it. Or even something like, oh yes, this test has been used in multiple environments. For example, author date discuss that. That tells us, oh, you're talking about that test and the different environments, and then you're giving us some supporting examples. Makes sense. Analysis and synthesis. You may have heard me talk about this in other webinars. These are things that people usually leave out when they're rushing to get started. And uh, it's harder when you don't have those topic sentences to know how things fit together to know which details are relevant to your argument. So make sure you have topic sentences and make sure that you discuss how the details that you are summarizing are important. If you start with the topic sentences, you'll have a better idea of what information is and isn't relevant. And if you try and add that retroactively, there'll just be a lot of cutting of writing that just wasn't needed. And that can be frustrating. It's also important to include wording, what I call logical bridges to connect the different ideas and sentences and show how you are discussing it. Is it analysis? Then you might have phrasing like this contrasts with, this aligns with, this agrees with, or the importance of this finding is limited because, and you're pointing out some detail. So uh, quick poll, how many siblings do you have? Now, when I ask this question, usually I'll get an answer of somewhere between zero and four, which is rare because the average American family now has uh, right around two kids. Now, I'm from a family of 11 kids. That's less common in the United States these days. And that means that we, as a family, there's some things that so many people growing up around each other, we kind of talk the same way. We have similar tastes in food for the most part. And a lot of similar reading because, you know, we've read all the books at the house and at the same library and such. And so that may give you findings that are not applicable to the broader population because we have all this stuff in common that other people don't. And even if you're looking at, say, people from the same school system, well... The average American does not read too many books these days. And for better or worse, that means that if you're part of a family that does read a lot, you'll have a lot of experience and input that other people do not. And so something that may be generalizable to your group may not be a something that you can apply for another one. And then for synthesis, the classic logical bridges are therefore, and this suggests that. Now, I do recommend that people start 
before they start writing the lit review body to ask themselves, well, what are the most important things that I found in the reading that I want to convey? And how am I going to structure this? How am I going to make it clear to myself and to the reader that this information belongs here? Is there a clear logical order? And do I take time to discuss where the gaps are in the literature versus just stating what has been done? Now, we have some time for questions and some time to look at in at least one example of a dissertation. If there aren't a lot of questions, we'll probably go ahead and take a quick break before we do the next webinar in this evening. But I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to bring up a resource that I strongly recommend. So if you search for ACU theses and dissertations or ACU ETD dissertations, you'll have the Electronic Thesis and Dissertations Digital Commons site. And this is where all ACU dissertations, doctoral studies, projects, and concept proposals and theses will get published in the end. And so we can look at, for example, uh, this is a recent graduate of the program. And let's take a look at how they organized their literature review chapter. Now, we can look at the abstract, and the abstract usually doesn't discuss much of the literature review because it's more focused on, and here's what my study was specifically doing. But if we go look at that dissertation, we can even just take a look at the table of contents. And looking at this, we see, okay, the first chapter was nine pages. The lit review chapter was 43, 44 pages. And then the research methods chapter was about 16 pages. The results, uh, that was somewhat substantial. Um, that's because they were including a lot of transcripts of responses, I believe. A, usually chapter four is a bit shorter than that. And then they their conclusions chapter, they had a lot to discuss, so that ended up being 27 pages. But by far, the uh, lit review is the most su substantial chapter. And if we look at this, we see that we have the literature search methods, the discussion of the theoretical framework, and then here's the body of the uh, lit review. Now, if we look at this, we see that we have a number of things going on here for the structure. And so we, they've organized it along some kind of sectional themes. So there's some background and context. Then they're discovering in specific stresses. Then they move to focus on teachers. And then we have some specific things related to the demographic they're targeting. So it does have clear clustering. Uh, personally, I would have organized it a little bit more hierarchically so that there is a clear um, a clear sense of how that's grouped together, but I wasn't advising that dissertation. And so that is that. Uh, you also see that there's some information that is included in the appendices here that might have gone into various chapters, but was by placing in the appendices, you help improve the flow because it's not being interrupted by big blobs of, oh, here's a complete set of interview questions. And sometimes people will put things related to the literature review you know, chapter that they found, but said, well, that's not so much relevant to my dissertation but it's something that I think is relevant to people who will be following up on my research. And so they'll put that stuff in an appendix. All right, let's look at one more example here. Uh, let's go ahead and look at this burnout study here. Now this is coming from our DMP program. So it, it's a project. And if we look at the table of contents, what will we find? So the literature review 
so this is one that places the discussion of the theoretical framework at the end. I would recommend it in having it earlier because it is a very brief literature review. And I bet that the theoretical framework provides a justification for why. So let's take a quick look there. Oh, yes. So they're using the Newman systems model uh, for their framework. Uh, I would call that a conceptual framework because it hasn't been validated to the extent that we call it a uh, framework. I'm sorry, that we call it a theory. But the, the Newman systems model focuses on a very particular set of details. And because of that, uh, that would explain why the literature review is relatively concise because it, there's a very specific set of things that it says these are important and the project was focusing on those. Okay. Well, if there are no additional questions, let us go ahead and if you're going to be attending the next webinar, uh, we will return on the hour, but enjoy a nice 15 minute break and we'll pick things up at seven o'clock central time. Thanks for coming.